ladies and gentlemen, hello everyone, this is Alice in Beijing. I'm so glad to meet you again at IKX Talks. Every Friday we have this wonderful event to connect the world and the universe. We try to invite the top scientists from the worldwide and to deliver their talks and their latest results to see how this high tech changes the world. So this IKX Talks was since April, so now it's already run eight times. This was eight times. And this is part one part of the uh, PKU's X license. This was an online class too. So this talk is very, very popular. Every week we have more than uh, 300,000 audience you know, worldwide. So we are so proud of that. So if you don't know more about IKX yet, please follow us on Twitter. Uh, please find the video replay on YouTube. And if you have some questions, suggestions, please take you know this IKX online survey. So uh, today is a big day for IKX talk. Today is also a big day for mine. For me, why? Because today is my day. It's my is young scientists lectures. As mine is an event we ran for several years. This was sponsored by uh, you know a journal was named Microsystem and Nano Engineer. So every year we pick up the uh, wonderful outstanding young scientists worldwide. And uh, today is a big show for all these young scientists, young stars. So yeah, this uh, this we have already four of them to present on this stage. Now the first welcome is Professor Chen Jiangyu. Chen Jiangyu was from Houston. I gave his nickname is as Rocky from Houston. We all know that Rocky you know, flew to the sky, space is from Houston. Uh, Chen Jiang was like this. Professor Yu was really young, but he is quite famous. He grew up so fast, get a lot of you know nice uh, work and many many recognized you know uh, technical uh, contributions in this area especially in the uh, robot uh, electronics. He is published in his lab and this is group in the last few years. It's get very well known in this world. So Chun Jiang, are you ready? Yeah. Chun Jiang, please turn on your video and turn on your uh, cameras. Yeah, now is your time. Yeah, please uh, yeah, share with us. Yeah. So Chun Jiang will give us a talk for the Ruby Electronics. Yeah, so the word is yours, Chun Jiang, please. Especially those great challenges are related to or associated with health and joy of living. So in particular, we're being interested in to creating uh, technologies or implementing uh, uh, devices that to understand the human body and also uh, biology and also to uh, provide remedy solutions. We are also interested in to creating or implementing smartness and saf safety into robotics or machines. So we believe that human and robotics or machines will team together and the boundary between them will become very blurry in the future. So specifically, we're utilizing soft electronics to solving these great challenges. So on one hand, human is full of organs, tissues that are mechanically soft. While conventional electronics, like synth wafer technologies, they are rigid. So to bridge electronics with human, Future electronics need to be also mechanically soft, similar as human body. On the other hand, soft electronics can also provide machines or robotics certain capabilities or uh, functions 
to allow them interacting in and responding in the complex environment. So my group in the past few years really covered the fundamental and application aspect of soft electronics. So particularly, uh, you know, we're a device research group and we're design and design new materials with tailored uh, properties for devices. And then we manufacture these materials. And of course, manufacturing is two naval manufacturing, manufacturing those materials, gearable manufacturing, and also manufacturing devices, te manufacturing technologies to allow us to build in the devices. Now, we utilize the materials and manufacturing technologies to creating devices for medical and for machines. So this is uh, generally what uh, my group has been covering. So uh, soft and trolleys is just an example that we have a top term research of solving the specific uh, application needs by seamlessly to merging biology or human body with future electronics. And we really come out of material solution and building devices to solving this uh, great challenge. So to start with, so look at the silicon wafer technology, conventional electronics. So instead of look at the electrical functions, but we look into the materials we're associated with for this uh, device, which includes conductors, conductor materials, dielectric materials, and also substrate of silicon wafer, for example. And uh, we look into the fundamental material properties uh, as a curve of stress. So we can see, you know, this metal is a ductile material. And also a lot of semiconductor materials or the dielectric materials, ceramics or inorganics, they are actually fairly brittle. So we can see none of these materials are behave like a piece of rubber. They are not made in So now, I know in the past day or so, there is a emerging field we call the searchable electrons. So now the electrons can be managed, but and these materials are not stretchable. And this has been so much in for health care, for portable electronics, for energy, for display. So how can you utilize unstretchable materials to create stretchable electronics? So this is really uh, coming from a single principle that probably everyone has been that's what we call the architectural engineering over here. So as an example, a piece of stainless steel, which is not a mechanical stretch. Now, if you coil them up, you can make a spring structures, and now you can stretch a spring. So you can see same material, but based on different architecture, it can We utilize this engineering concept, and by applying to our engineering designs, we actually can create, for example, so it's very beautiful that part is modern and you actually can create a very beautiful waves depending on the place of the radio field and also a difference between the models. So once we create these wrinkle structures, you apply mechanical stretch. And instead of directly fracture a rigid piece of material or fail those materials, but now actually you're changing or modeling waves or amplitude of these wave structures. So now you know how to create different types of stretchable electronics, where the electronics are building, built, uh, built based on these rigid films. So it's very nice. Uh, we can create these auto plan uh, structures then we can make in device stretchable. So this is talking about the direction. What about implant? So in also open mesh structures. So now similarly, when you apply mechanical stretch, you're op you're opening these meshes, and instead of directly thinner this material, but now you're changing the geometry to accommodate the mechanical stretch. So the implant is also a very powerful technique to creating many, many stretchable electronics. And in the field of stretch electronics, this architectural engineering has been really dominant to creating a lot of devices for many applications. But you know, what I, one thing I want to mention, especially uh, 
many people and many advances has been uh, really uh, work uh, has been uh, exist in this field, including my my group and also a lot of many pioneers. For example, John Rogers, Yang Gang Huang has been creating this uh, uh, technology out of plan implant structures, and uh, this is out of plan. Uh, uh, structure designs is also my PhD thesis, and later on, I work with uh, uh, John John Rogers and uh, creating uh, uh, this implant uh, structure designs for many many stretchable electronic device development. So it's been very successful and it's been proven to be uh, uh, working very well. But one thing is when we look into the problem, especially when we uh, utilize these devices, try to merging with biology, especially for organs or tissues, problem comes. So for example, if you look at the existing stretch electronics, based on architectural and engineering design, when we use our hand to stretching a spring structure or deform it, so we can feel the mechanical stretchability. But the mechanical stretchability is at a structure level or macroscopic level. So now, once we utilize this technology or architecture engineering to interface with organs, tissues. So for example, a heart over here. So heart is made of heart tissues with different cardiac cells. So you can see those organ tissues actually they mechanic deformable, but also those cells actually there are no rigid components involved. So now once, especially once we try to utilize this architecture engineering principle and bridge or interface with those tissues, cells, the tissue and the cell will not be able to feel the macroscopic mechanical stretchability. They can only feel the microscopic or local material stiffness. So this has become a challenge. So the question is, can we have a way to creating electronics that have mechanical stretchability at both macroscopic level and also microscopic level? So this is a, a challenging question to solve. So in the past few years, we really have been thinking and we try to creating a fundamentally different way of creating electronics, which we call the rubber electronics. Rubber electronics is type of electronics that completely made out of rubber materials. So we want to utilize materials following this red strength stress curve. And this red strength stress curve, we can mechanic stretch and also release back in the force and without feel this material. So what we think is that if we have all these electronic materials with this mechanical property, and then we can immediately probably can turning a piece of glove we're wearing in, in the laboratory now to make it a piece of integral circuits. So with this technology, then actually immediately many, many positive outcomes or impacts we're bringing. For example, they really bring new electronics, new optoelectronics, new design principles, new bioelectronic platforms, new machine interface technologies, et cetera. And one of the most uh, striking advances is it really solving this great challenge of seamless integration between electronics and biology, because now all the electronics are very similar to the organs, to the tissues, to the cells in terms of their mechanical property, mechanical deformable. So, to creating this type of uh, rubber electronics or bioelectronic platform, we actually as aggressively associated with a lot of electronics, such as active metrics for readout circuits, analog digital circuits, sensors. So to create these circuits, components, sensors, so the fundamental units to creating these devices is a transistor. Now, to make a transistor, we also know Transistor associated with at least three key materials. So why is the semiconductor? Why is the conductor? Why is dielectric? So that's we really want to utilize this rubbery version of all these materials in this regime of the strength stress curve to creating rubber electronics. So as I mentioned, there are so much uh, advances uh, in the uh, past few decades in terms of material development. So now let's see what the community has been offered us. So look into the conductors. So making a conductor be stretchable that have the similar mechanical property use all the soft materials, you can immediately find out people has been researching of 0D of the nanoparticles, 1D nanowire or nanotubes, 2D of nanoflakes, and mixing and creating these composite structures. 
or even these days, talking about these organic conductors, they can tender their mechanic property and they can make it a very soft, like a piece of rubber. So it's been great. There are a lot of options. So the specific material, what we have been creating and be utilizing is we're using nanowire materials, especially we're using silver nanowire materials over here for our uh, devices, which I'm gonna describe in the next few slides. The uh, reason we're utilizing this nanowire material is because it's very high SP ratio, and that we will only need a very small amount of material to allow the percolation working. And also for these materials, we actually care about the uh, surface functions that we can chemically modify to allow the match between the semiconductor and the conductors to allow the uh, creating the ohmic context instead of uh, uh, shutter key barriers. So basically the message is that there are tons of options for conductors. Now let's look at the dielectric material. So dielectric material, for example, elastomers, they're electrically insulating materials or a lot of ionic geos, they're also mechanically stretchy, but they also has been proven to be utilized for dielectric materials. Looks like this is also not a problem. So what about semiconductor? So when we start uh, looking at this problem back in uh, five, four or five years ago, there are no such a material exists. So the first challenge problem is that can we create a rubbery, stretchable semiconductor materials? So we have been working on and come out different types of options, but one uh, option eventually worked out is we're actually utilizing this polysilphene uh, nanomaterials and especially in the way of the nanofiber structures, and then we can create an elastomer matrix as the double penetrated composites for the nanofiber structures. And when you mechanically stretch it, even in some places are losing their junctions, but still those wires actually have certain connections to allow the carrier to uh, transport through the whole network. So based on uh, this design principle, we count a way to creating this material uh, we utilize the solution phase of material by inducing the cooling and resulting in this uh, homogeneous uh, self-assembly approach to creating the nanofiber structures. And then we can introduce this uh, rubber matrix network. And eventually we can utilize this material to creating, for example, a solidified rubber material, which is looking like, uh, as I showed over here, the uh, microscopic structures the uh, bright color represents this uh, nanofiber structures. So you can see we can stretch 10%, 30%, 50%. And we do observe some of the disconnection size for these nanofiber structures. But overall, based on our device evaluation, this actually, or those materials still function as a semiconductor. And uh, macroscopically, this is a piece of rubber material. So you can stretch, you can twist. So one thing I want to also highlight over here is we're creating this type of rubbery semiconductor material is we really want to eventually make it integral electronics. So now the most important thing for uh, utilize this material is you allow the scalable manufacturing. So based on solution phase of the precursors, we actually allowing all the coding printing technologies to allow us to creating integral electronics. So indeed, this is our a first generation of the materials. So because of time, I will skip the details, which you probably can find more in this uh, literature. And later on, we actually also improving these materials and uh, to creating more and more a uh, scalable manufacturing material. For example, road to road manufacturing by harnessing the water air interface and also the phase separation, we can creating rubber semiconductor film in the road to road process of banner and also those devices can be row to row manufactured. So it means now we have a way to creating this rubber semiconductor. So now we have all the material options. So then the first test bed device is a transistor, a basic unit or building block for the electronics. So for those who are not very familiar with the transistor, so transistor is an electronic device that been very similar to a mechanical device that so water faucet is the back of the gate, mechanic generation to modulate the source and the of the water current. So is you're applying the gate voltage to the gate, uh, 
on the G on the gate end, and then to modulate the source and drain current flow through the S and D terminals. So now the good thing is that different from traditional silicon-based technologies, we all based on rubber materials. So these rubber materials, we can allow to creating a rubber transistor, eventually we can mechanically stretch. So we based on this uh, device architecture and also the material associated with, we do find out this device working very well. So this is utilized our first generation of the semiconductor materials. And we do see applying a few volts of the gate voltage, we have the few orders of magnitude and modulation of the source and drain current. And most strikingly is that these devices, you can mechanically stretching, for example, 10% along the channel length direction, along source and drain, or by 30, 50%. Even you stretch perpendicular uh, to the uh, channel length direction by also 50%. Those device working very well. And, but we do see some of the current changes. Current level, for example, the source and drain current level uh, have certain uh, differences. So to evaluate those device performance, the one of the very critical measure of this device is looking to the field effect mobility. All right, so based on the capacitor model of the transistor, so we can run this equation of IDS is a factor of the geometry of the transistor and also the gated capacitor times the mobility, which is denotes the how fast the carriers move under a unified uh, uh, electrical field between the source and the drain, and also the gate voltage by uh, this uh, uh, <clears throat> second order. And we can rewrite this equation and instead of using the VG square, but now we actually can have the VG, which we plot in this uh, blue curve over here. And this blue curve represents the VG as a <clears throat> relationship to the uh, square root of IDS, which is very important because now we can have direct information to find out how the gate modulation of the IDS. But one thing also find out is, if you look at this equation, and this equation, the square root term over here is actually the slope of this uh, square root IDS versus the I, uh, VG. So now, based on this uh, slope, we can calculate from the curve, we can also derive the field effect mobility. So based on this field effect mobility, we find out that <clears throat> this material actually, or this device even after stretching by 50%, this device working very well at the transistor. And, but we do see the mobility have the 40 to 50% of decrease, which is what we expected because once you mechanically stretching these nanofiber structures and there are actually disconnection sites and eventually uh, reduce the transport efficiency, that's the uh, field effect mobility decrease to so somehow. So, and, and also I want to mention here, this is our first generation materials. So the mobility in the range of one, one center square per volt seconds. It's good, but it's not great for integral electronics. Eventually we want to making, converting a, a piece of rubber to integral circuits. So now we want the transistor working very high performance. So now the caliper is how can you make the device being uh, very high performance or creating this uh, high mobility materials. So indeed, this is our second generation material, which we call a high mobility rubber semiconductors. Instead of this two material system, but now we're incorporating the third material. The third material we incorporated specifically over here is where you utilize metallic carbon nanotube and also has a very low aspect ratio. This is on purpose because we want this um, a very low aspect ratio does not short the channel of the transistors. And also we utilize this metal component too because the working function match very well of the homo level of the polysiphon nano fiber to allow the carrier to easily flow through. So we come out of material fabrication and also optimization approach based on looking to the drain current and also the off ratio, looking to the mobility. The details, because of time, I will skip, but you can find out in, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, reference, this is the below over here. And we find out that if you put a 0.5 weight percent of metallic component in the composites, you actually maximize this material with the fairly high mobility and also high off ratio. 
So especially we boost the mobility by from one to 10 by introducing this metallic carbon nanotube. So also we're not just making one transistor, but we're making integrated array of devices. So this is a eight by eight array or based on the printing process. And this is the mobility map, fairly uniform uh, device mobility. And everything is made of piece of rubber. So you can mechanically stretching, you know, bending, uh, or kind of mechanic deformation. The device does not fail after many, many cycles of the operation. So we have the uh, technology and the materials to creating this uh, rubbery transistor integral electronics. But if you look at our computer and uh, also the integral circuit chips, so they are actually working digitized or talking about zero one operations. So we also are creating a logic case, which for example, you have the inverter input one, you generate zero and also other case like NAND case and NOR case. So the message here I want to tell you is based on our rubbery transistor technologies and we can create a fully rubbery logic case. And those logic case, even under mechanic stretching, they can preserve their logic functions. So the details also can find out in the paper over here. So with this uh, uh, logic case, of course, it's not a fully very hierarchy complicated uh, integral circuits yet. That's something we still been working on. Hopefully we're gonna come out integration level up to thousands, even more. So now we have those uh, transistor and uh, integral electronic technologies. So some of the things immediately we think this uh, technology can be really helping solving the challenge is, for example, uh, smart skin. So smart skin is a great technology, but the smart skin, especially when the sensing nodes significantly increase, then you're facing a lot of challenges. So for example, if you have uh, tens, hundreds, or even thousands of the uh, uh, channels or sensing nodes, so the crosstalk, the wiring, it's really become a problem. And uh, what we have been thinking is, can we create a smart skin and utilize our transistor actometric technologies to solve this challenge? Because this technology is working similar like a display we're being utilizing. And particularly we're uh, creating a tactile sensor skin based on fully rubber technology, utilize the actometrics of the electronics. So this is the device uh, architecture I wanna show here. And you can see the sensor components over here is a pressure sensitive rubber and it's mechanic deformable, a piece of rubber. And also the electronics part is all based on rubber electronics. So now putting this together and you can see now we're pretty much creating a touch skin, uh, interactive skin that can resolve the uh, tactile uh, pressure. So the working principle for this device is that you apply the mechanical pressure for each channel of the device Actually, this will induce a change of the voltage across the channel resistor. And by scanning the bit and word line of this voltage, then we can back calculate the tactile or the pressure applied on the, uh, the, on the skin. So now you can have the multiple channels of the skin active matrix technologies. And uh, again, everything is made of piece of rubber, so you can deform and also this device can resolve the uh, pressures applied. So based on this technology, immediately this can really solving or uh, implementing this uh, smart skins, e-skins for many, many applications for robotics, for artificial or, or uh, uh, skin prosthetics. So now for skin prosthetics, one thing I also want to mention here is, especially say we're touching our arm, all right? So once you touch, touch your skin, you actually can feel it. So what's going on? So the mechanism is really you, actually your skin have many mechanical receptors. So those mechanical receptors upon the mechanical stimulation, they generate those uh, receptor uh, potentials. Those re receptor potentials actually will activate those biological synapses and uh, transmit through the nerve fibers and generate those post-synaptic potentials and eventually to your brain. So now your brain can feel it. So one attribute I want to also mention for this synapse or neuron functions is this actually, also those neuron functions, uh, those neuron synapses are mechanic deformable. Even those uh, present uh, in, uh, exist in the, our tissues, in the uh, spinal cord, 
there can be mechanics stretched by more than 30 or even more, 30% or more. So I can use one extreme case of Earth one. So Earth one, they can extend their body by a few times. Their uh, synapse, neuron synapse also can allow this mecha large mechanical deformation. So now the question is that can we create a very elastic neuron functions and in building into our skin uh, devices. So this, what we, the core technology behind it is we creating uh, elastic synaptic devices that allow the neuron function memory capabilities to exist in these uh, devices. So because of time, I will skip the details, but uh, what I want to emphasize here is based on a uh, similar, like a transistor tech, uh, architectures, we can creating uh, elastic stretchable a neuron, a neurologically synaptic devices, and the after mechanical stretching, they still can preserve this uh, memory effect, uh, these uh, neuron functions. And with this technology, we actually can create a smart skin. So for example, our smart skin like our, behave like our natural skin. The skin we build in this uh, rubber elastic uh, mechanical receptors. So now once we mechanically press, interacting with our skin, so we generate those, the, uh, potentials. Those potentials actually will trigger this uh, synaptic transistors, and eventually they can generate arrays depending on number of sensing nodes you have or the mechanical receptor you're interacting. So now you generate arrays of post-synaptic uh, current or you resolve in this post-synaptic uh, post potential. So now you can mapping out this post-synaptic potential, then you can trigger in this biological neurons. So this is a device you know, we have those uh, artificial uh, synaptic uh, transistor devices and also with the mechanical receptor units or based on rubber devices. And we can resolving this uh, post-synaptic potential. And also we have been working really utilize this post-synaptic potential to triggering this biological neurons. So that way, eventually you have the uh, skin prosthetic, you're interacting with the artificial skin, your brain can feel it. So this is something we have been uh, working. And with this technology, it's also, uh, we feel like <clears throat> probably also changed the way how the robotics behaves. Traditionally robotics, the operation or based on the control or the command by the operator. So now what we have been thinking is eventually those robotics become very smart. So we have been really uh, asking ourselves, can we create in robotics that allow the robotics to think like our human or animals, or even they have a mindset like us. So how to uh, achieve this capability? So it looks like with the neurological function integrated skins, we can implement this uh, soft neural robot. Of course, this is a first strike along this direction. We really have been implementing this uh, neurological uh, neural robots with uh, smart skin technologies and use the neuron decoded signal based on the robotic memory. And we can actually give the command by interacting uh, without giving any command by, but the robotics once interacting with external environment, they can memorize and they can uh, perform their, for example, chronic motions. So this is uh, one example of based on the interaction, like a tapping modes of the specific uh, neurological decoded signals, then they can give the they can allow the robot to automatically to walking or changing uh, angles or some other motion behaviors. So the detail of the neural de uh, decoded signals, this also be appear in the literature uh, in the uh, end of the slides. So I already show a couple of examples of creating these engineering devices using our rubbery electronic technologies. So now I also, you know, going back because we really want to uh, seamlessly integrate them with the human body with uh, the electronics. So this is one example, which we called a uh, rubbery uh, bioelectronics, utilize the epicardial patch as an example. So this epicardial patch, we actually are now to creating a rubbery bioelectronics patch and sitting on a beating heart. And also we can allow special temporal mapping of the electrocardiogram signals. And uh, this is a real time monitoring uh, of this uh, R peak over here. And the cardiologists become very excited because the device is so soft, they can concurrently deform with the heart and also they can simultaneously to mapping out the ECG signals. 
and not just the mapping of the signal, but also give the detailed information of how the signal propagating along different directions to identify the arrhythmia or tracking the arrhythmia behaviors. So now we also, you know, for this uh, rubbery bioelectronic patch, we also integrate some other electronic sensing functions and even therapeutic devices to creating this whole functional bioelectronic patch with for moni a hard behavior monitoring, pacing, and also therapeutic uh, capabilities. So with that, I think uh, my time is pretty much over there, and I would like to uh, quickly summarize my talk by providing a road map. So this road map is really placed in contact with what a last century has been strikingly advanced the whole world, which talk about uh, back in the 40s, uh, with uh, realized the importance of piece of the black rock silicon, now need to the four, uh, 40s of creating a nonlinear electronic device called a transistor. So now, later on, early 60s, creating this circuit devices from text instrument and then later on have the large scale integration or very large, even ultra large uh, scale, uh, large, ultra large scale integration. So uh, for our rubber electronics, so over the few years, we have been developing rubber semiconductor materials and uh, keep improving this material to allow us to give a very uh, high performance of those electronics transistors and to uh, creating or allow this transistor device working and also we creating uh, circuit functions for the rubber electronics. And of course, we also been uh, working on the integral electronics. The level of integration is not comparable with the VOSR yet, but this is some of the direction we have been working on. But simultaneously, we also have been immediately utilize our rubber electronics for a lot of applications, applications for human and for machines. So with that, I would like to stop here, but I would like to acknowledge the work being done by my, my group. And especially I want to highlight uh, here uh, two alumni uh, from my group, Hei Jin Kim and also Kyusan uh, Sim. So they're uh, now a professor some, uh, in uh, Korea. And also a few other people I highlight here, they're taking the need of the rubber electronics in my uh, group. And uh, the animal experiment has been really uh, being uh, 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 working with uh, uh, fantastic collaborators at the Baylor College of Medicine of Doc Dr. Taylor and also uh, University of Chicago of Dr. O. And finally, I would like to uh, acknowledge the uh, funding supporter to allow us to carry out this work. And thank you very much. Okay, great. Chen Jia, as always, your talk is fantastic. So yeah, there are a few questions was come out. So first is uh, yeah, wonderful talk, Professor Yu. Yeah, uh, is one to ask you for the questions for the long term stability of a rubber electronics and uh, yeah, how about the temperature and uh, you know humidity the effect on these materials? Clear? This is a great question. So the. Uh, the uh, long-term stability, it is, so it's a very challenging problem. So we have been really working on this problem. So I can tell you, uh, based on our, so far, the experiment results, we didn't do any aging tests, but uh, we have been creating uh, this uh, transistor device and stay there for more than two years. It's still working very well. And there's a reason behind it why this material system or the device is more stable. It's because the material actually compared with pristine organic materials, now we have this rubber matrix. It's really helping actually preventing this uh, interaction with the uh, moisture environment or other things. So this is uh, <clears throat> you know, a good thing about it. And temperature uh, do actually change this uh, a carrier uh, a concentration, like the silicon technologies. Uh, this device is working fairly well uh, under uh, about 100 degree, but over 100 degree, you're gonna cause in problem, material gonna degradate. Okay, great. So the second question is, uh, can you compare your rubber electronics with the silicon or the, some latest results from the silicon, uh, uh, silicon uh, carbon nanotube based electronics or other soft electronics? Can you compare with your technology with that? Sure, this is a great question. Uh, <clears throat> so 
A silicon technology, so single core silicon has a mobility of 1500 square per volt seconds. And a carbon nanotubes, even uh, graphene, those materials can over 10,000. Mm -hmm. So our uh, rubber semiconductor, so far what we have been achieving is about 10. So you can see, you know, we're still very, uh, you know, uh, still neck behind. So that's something we uh, keep improving. So in terms of the uh, flexible electronics, uh, <clears throat> I think a rubber electronics is really uh, good in terms of mechanical uh, uh, properties. So depending on your application, if you really want to make a gigahertz uh, operation of the computer chips, I don't think a rubber uh, electronics can be immediately to replace this technology. But for some of the technologies, for frequent requirements not that aggressive, then for example, some of the bioelectronics, interface electronics, reading out circuits for, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, bioelectronics. So this rubber tonic could uh, uh, have certain advantages. Okay, I have a, a question following this. So uh, can you tell us something for the fabrication for your rubber electronics? Is uh, you can also use for the software electronics, you know, the printing and all these kind of technologies is the same? Uh, yes, so the material we're so far been working on is primarily based on all kind of printing or spin coding process. So make them being compatible with conventional microfabrication. And even uh, one thing I want to also highlight here is the, uh, the rubber electronics is a macro electronics. We're also using a very low cost, but for large area, which called a 3D printing or some other screen printing technology. So this looks like they are very versatile to work with, with different types of uh, traditional microfabrication and also uh, this uh, screening, uh, those are, uh, uh, emerging uh, printing technologies. Okay, uh, here is another question from Professor Yu. Uh, how about the adaptability between different materials and different layers? I think for you know several layers, so the adapt uh, adaptability. So uh, this material actually, it's a very thin material. So they actually can uh, adapt very well in terms of conformal coding. So yeah, so far we didn't have a very deep trenches involved. So it, it looks like it's okay. But I think it's if it's very deep trenches, we have to be looking very careful. Okay, great. So the last question is for the you know, roadmap. You print, uh, give the roadmap for your rubber electronics. So here is what's the big advantage for this technology? What's the target market? So this is also a, a great question. I think, uh, uh, you know, the market could be really from different sector of the industry. For example, the interactive uh, displays, uh, touch panels, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, smart uh, suits, and uh, even a lot of bioelectronics. I think the application is, is, is very broad. Okay, great, Chen Jiang, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for your wonderful talk, for your great you know, question answers. Yeah, okay, yeah, I will give you a certification as Euro, uh, because, you know, on IKX Talks, we invited the uh, most famous professor in the field. Today is really, you know, special. We want to, you know, deliver this certification to Chen Jiang. Uh, can you switch back to Chun Jiang? Yeah, Chun Jiang, yeah. So this is for you, the certification for Connect the World and Universe in ICANX Talks. Thank you so much. Thank you.